Welcome to Brew Crime, where we talk about crimes, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. I am JT, and here with my co-host, Mike. Yes, it's been a grand total of 30 seconds since we ended this last episode, and we're on to the next one. Yes, we're back into Quebec again. We sure are. Um, This one's not as... I mean, it's dark, but it's not... Mm, there's a little more we can talk about with this one, I think, in terms of, like, this guy was dumb. <laughs> so that. Sweet. I like to cover those kind of guys. Yes, I do um, too. So uh I don't have a beer pairing tonight. Um I have a nickname for this guy, Albert Gway. Uh, and it is his nickname's Bud Light, and that is what I'm <laughs> that's what I'm <laughs> drinking today. So quality for beer be- for a quality yeah. Yeah, and I'll be moving on to a different one because I, I just I told I told Mike earlier to everybody, um, you know, seeing through the curtain to the backstage, I was like, well, I realized all I have is Bud Light and maybe a sour ale in my fridge. And I just couldn't get out. So <laughs> here we are. But yeah, so we're going to talk about Albert Gway. I'm going to call him Gway. If it's Gway, I'm going to say it all wrong the entire time. And that's OK. That's, that's OK. That, <laughs> that's that's a Gway. So if I give away, if I, the title that I have is not very creative and I don't want to give it away so much. So we're going to just hop into this. So it's an interesting thing, love. It makes us do some stupid as shit things. But what happens if you happen to be extremely stupid to begin with? Hmm. Oh, no. And to be clear, I'm not talking intelligent or unintelligent, but rather just someone who, well, if this wasn't so dramatic and terrible, he'd probably end up on an episode of Brewery Report. Very easily. Ooh. So the real question here is, what would you do to be with the person you loved? Or rather, thought you loved? I think oh. most of us would say, well, I'd pretty much do anything if I loved them. Well, you you know what? You'd be totally valid in that response. But you <laughs> see, you see, Albert Gouet of Quebec, Canada has a little more to his story than a simple bout of lovesickness. So let's get into this. Let's talk about Albert Gway and the bombing of Canadian Pacific Airlines DC-3. Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Aha. So a little bit of background. Albert Gway was born September 22nd, 1917 in Charity on the south shore of St. Lawrence across the river from Quebec City. Oh. He was the Yes, he was the youngest of five children <laughs> and was the son of a brake man who worked for Canadian National Railways. CM. His, Yes, nice. his dad his dad was killed in a train accident when he was five. So no more connection. Um <laughs> Okay. Train station wrong. Honestly, there's there's no accident I really can imagine resulting in death involving a train that is even remotely not cringeworthy. Oh god, um, yeah. So we're not gonna I I don't have the answer of what happened to him. We just let's assume it probably wasn't good. Um, Bad. I learned that nearly all French Canadian children are given two Christian names, and they typically drop the biblical name and go with the middle one. Albert wasn't going to do that at that time. He always Hmm. prefaced his name with the initial J. Everyone else just called him Albert, but he always wanted J. Albert. He was, uh, yeah, he was slightly out of touch and he was always seeking a stature that he would never reach. And that was, that's something to keep in mind, I think. Yeah. Throughout this, Um, he dressed in a really flashy way. He wanted to be a singer and orchestra leader. And in my sources, it said, quote, to be sure, he had no musical aptitude and a commonplace voice. But he was forever, yeah, he was forever whistling the latest hit tunes as though this might somehow lead him closer to his ambition. That's, it's like the equivalent of if I walked by like, like a very popular voice actor and I did the voice just hoping he overheard me and I got a job out of that. Yeah. I mean, that'd be lovely, but yeah, I'm sorry, Albert. No. Yeah. He Um, probably has just as much a chance of getting a record deal as I do. None. (laughs) You have a better chance than Albert. I don't um, think so. <laughs> well, uh, he really should have lived during the age of TikTok because honestly, he probably would have been internet famous if 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 it was then. Well, yeah, because people have gotten famous for being bad too. Yeah, yeah. Who was that musician true. that was on one of those like uh, reality oh, like music American shows? Idol, um, whatever it was? Uh, uh, William Hung. She yeah. bang, she bang, oh baby! Yeah, and he he, yes. he became massive. He did, he did. Just online, not um, for music, but right. Well, <laughs> you know, in his in in Gwei's defense, he did orchestrate something. It just wasn't a piece of music. So there we are. 
Um, after his father died around 1922, he moved with his family to L- Limoilu, a suburb in Quebec. Bless you. I'm making I'm making that sound a lot more French than it probably even sounds, but I'm going to do that for all these words. Um, Perfect. Because maybe I'll be right. Uh, he never had a formal education. Around the age of 16, he spent a lot of time in pool halls where he earned money selling watches and jewelry on commission to other folks who spent time there. Jeez. In, yeah. That's in an 19, interesting 40, thing to do. <laughs> isn't it? I don't know how he got a hold of them to sell them, but you know, what are we going to do? In 1941, at the age of 23, he got a job at St. Malo Arsenal in Quebec. He didn't do anything that required a ton of skill as he worked at a grinding machine, but he did get deferred from any military service because of the job he had. So he missed World War Two. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Probably. I don't know. And he added to those wages by selling jewelry to other employees at the arsenal. So, you know, he's into jewelry. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> He was able to buy a car, and apparently around this time, he was considered a dashing fella. In August 1941, he married Rita Morel, and they moved into an apartment in the lower town section of Quebec. And this is near to, this is basically as near to a, quote, slum as Quebec has, and it was inhabited by French Canadians who were unable to kind of rise up from their lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mostly probably because they just weren't allowed he also met someone at the arsenal who became a good friend of his and eventual accomplice, Marguerite Ruest. So Marguerite was born in 08, 1908. Her father was a cook in a lumber camp and she grew up in a tough environment. Quote, she was dark complexion, dark haired, broad faced, dumpy woman with a caustic oh, Jesus tongue. Christ. And she was always willing to do someone a favor. Again, quote i quote <laughs> yes oh my um, god oh that is, like, that is such a rough thing to like t- it tell is. about someone isn't it it really it really is it really is um she spent two months in jail for illegally selling alcohol when she was 22 so okay i like know, i'm woman. on board i know yeah. i like that one uh thought by provincial police that she had given birth over the years to 14 children by a variety of men I don't think this is really that important, but it's just kind of part of the character development because whatever the total number was, she was she only brought up two of those 14, if it was oh 14. Oh, my God. That's a lot of kids. That's even yeah. more than my grandma had. Oh, what what was your grandma's number? Uh, 11 no, I... living. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Bless well, your grandma. Nine survived long term, but two died okay. young. There was miscarriages. Yeah. <laughs> okay yeah she was catholic <laughs> every sperm is sacred i won't sing it anymore i don't want to pay for rights she married one son's father at the start of world war ii then the other boy was fathered by a man named petra i'm gonna say peter no because i can't call her mrs peter we're gonna go with petra she began living with him yeah she began living with him while still married to the first man after she left Mashad. The first boy's son, he died, and in May 1949, she married Petra. She took this name and was known as Mrs. Petra. Henceforth, she shall always be known as Mrs. Petra. Um, She was industrious. She worked as a waitress, took in borders. She had connection to the shadier parts of town, which she was more than happy to connect her friends with. Reportedly, she occasionally performed abortions as well. So she kind of did everything. Uh, yeah, she was a Mrs. Petra of all trades and a master of none. Selling booze, fighting for women's rights, basically by doing abortions. Take it, take yeah. it. So Mrs. Petra, yeah. in yeah, she enjoyed Gway's company. He was nine years younger than her. There was always conversation about the nature of their relationship, and she said, "quote I am like a mother to him." When asked if the relationship with Mrs. Petra was more than just a friendship, he said, "quote." So she said, I am like a mother to him. And he said, quote, have you seen her? Impossible. <laughs> Which is interesting. One of these things is not like the other. Yep. Um, Mrs. Petra was the connection between Gway and the third accomplice. That's right. A threesome, a triumvirate, the worst. And that was her older brother, Jeanne-Rue Ruist. So um, jeanne he in 1949 he was the bachelor of 51 good on you mate uh who was impacted by tuberculosis of both hips and could only walk with crutches apparently he was an extremely talented watchmaker though so 
you know, he he went through some struggles, but he was a fantastic watchmaker. And maybe those were the watches that what's his name was selling. There was a link there. There was a link there. Um, he wasn't a dude who had much of a moral compass, as apparently when he was a patient in a Catholic hospital, he persuaded a nun who was his nurse to allow him to entertain a prostitute in his private room by telling the nun that the woman was his wife. So that's a genius. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. It's also a very gullible nun. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not surprised. They're not I would very literally worldly a lot of the time. If, I would literally watch a movie called The Gullible Nun. I really would. <laughs> um, so we've heard about the two minor players and all of this, this relatively. Back to Gway, who around this time was a full-time jewelry salesman and had moved his wife to Seven Islands, where his daughter Lisa was born in 1945. He sold rings, crucifixes, watches, and picked up watches in need of repair. Where did he get those watches repaired? At Ruist's place, yes, right? Yes, of course. So, Gway, although he had moved away from Lower Town, dropped in to a cafe in Lower Town and ended up meeting a waitress named Marie-Ange Rabatal. She, she was described as, quote, a tall, lanky, well-built, not very bright girl with a pleasant voice, jet black hair, plucked eyebrows, a turned up nose, and large dark eyes that frequently looked as if she hadn't been getting enough sleep. You can tell this article was older. And it was written by a fucking man, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Jesus Christ. Sure. But you have a picture in your head now. She was quite lovely. Um, I saw a picture. I don't think that's the correct description, but whatever. Um, when she met Gwei, she told him she was 19, but she was actually 17. Ooh, um, shit. Uh, and he was married. Let's not forget this. With a kid. Yeah. A relationship ensued. They actually told her parents... Um, and she knew he was married with a kid, but they told her, they told her parents that he was a bachelor by the name of Roger Andrews, which was stolen God. from a singer he wished he was. <laughs> That's where he took that name from. Big surprise. Uh, right. Gway gave him a, gave her a ring, relatively easy for him to do since he probably had them in his pocket. Yeah. He moved his family to St. Savour Street in Lower Town, where they rented most of the ground floor of a modern apartment house. This had a storefront and a home connected. He advertised his business. The disc jockey advertising said that, quote, if listeners wanted to get their watches broken forever, they should visit. They should bring them to Gway's place. So wow. not a lot of trust in Gway. No, um, but it didn't matter because the last check he sent to the disc jockey bounced. So <laughs> <laughs> jokes on you. I'd um, probably do the same thing then. Yeah. Yeah. Despite being married, Gway visited Marianne's uh, family home Two or three nights a week. Oh, jeez. I, I can't even get out, really, two or three nights. Oh, I don't know how. Okay, anyways, Gway's wife in November of 1948 learned about his little fling. People in the town were gossiping about it for a while now, but she finally put it all together. And boy, did she go right to the Robotel house. Um, so, Marie-Ange, her parents kicked her out of the house. Oh, jeez. Yeah, she contacted Gway, who then contacted Mrs. Pietra, who gave her a place to stay. At that point, she was living three doors down from the mayor of Quebec, Mrs. Pietra was. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, so she packed up and moved to St. Valier Street in Lower Town. So Mrs. Pietra left. She took uh, Marie-Ange with her. Gway paid the rent. Her parents realized they made a huge mistake and wanted her to come home, but they had a hard time finding her, and it didn't help that she was pretending to live in Montreal and sent a postcard about it when she was on a two-day visit there with Gway, so they really thought she was in Montreal. And again, this is a long time ago, so yeah, oh, yeah, it's a lot easier to do this. Right, so eventually in 49, she decided she wanted to go home. She wanted nothing more to do with Gway, not a, not a moment more. Well, and we're going to see this as a theme, and no matter the reason, she would go back to him. Actually, it does matter because Gway was a dick. He was controlling, jealous, hateful, and I would say psychologically abusive with a hint of physical abuse. And we're going to see about that in just a moment. Yeah. And um, this is actually a quote from A Husband, A Wife, and a Time Bomb published in The New Yorker. Presumably, that is a great title. I know, isn't it? Um, they stole it from me. Or I would have stole it from them. Presumably with the idea of substantiating her story by having her parents meet her at the station, she decided she would return to them by way of Montreal. 
Accordingly, she borrowed $50 from the proprietor of a restaurant she had worked in and brought and bought a round trip railroad ticket to Montreal. She booked space on a night train one cold evening and while she was waiting for her birth to be made to be made up, went into the ladies washroom of the sleeping car. Presently, there was a knock on the door and it was Gway who had followed her and who told her that if she didn't get off the train right away, he would make a scene. He took her back to the Richelieu Street apartment where, as a precaution against her trying to escape again, he threw her gloves into a stove and went to bed with her coat wrapped around him. The next morning, in an effort to embarrass her into staying put, he bit her in the face several times. Then he went off and cashed in her unused train ticket. Jesus Christ. Yeah, this guy's an asshole. Yes. So at this point, Gwei thinks he knows what he wants. He thinks he knows, despite the fact that Marie-Ange wanted to leave him, a married man, and return to her family. And despite his actions to prevent that, he wants what he wants. So we have to take a moment to consider what's in his path to obtaining what he wants. By the way, women aren't just something that you can want. That's not how this works. So let me just say that now. So in April of the same year, he approached a friend of his, 21-year-old Lucien, Lucien. Jesus. Yeah, Corot. He offered him $500 to murder Mrs. Quay, his wife. His plan was right out of a cheesy noir movie. He wanted Corot to take a bag of poison and a bottle, a bag of poison and a bottle of cherry wine to Quay's house asking for his wife. Then chat for a while and offer her a glass of wine after putting the poison in. He heard Gway out, told him he was crazy, then dismissed the idea and left. (laughs) Well, the idea is crazy. It is. I mean, this isn't Russia. Well, his entire judgment or justification for this was that his wife was prone to cherry wine and she would not say no. So obviously this was going to work, right? It's interesting. Like, I guess maybe cherry wine is more prominent there. I've never really heard of a cherry wine before. I haven't either. I'm wondering if it was more time period. So I don't know maybe. much about I don't know much about the cherry wine side. Yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's like a big crop of cherries in that part of Quebec or something. It's yeah, yeah. We do have a winery here in Langley right. that does a lot of different fruit wines. So I mean that part's not totally out of left field, but it's yeah. just kind of a weird note. Yeah, it is. It is. Um so Gway was trying at every which way to come up with a plan when on May 7th, 1949, Philippine Airlines had a plane that blew up, falling into the sea, killing 13 people. The scenario for this was actually quite similar to what Gway was experiencing. Canada covered this in their press, and it's probably the way Gway became acquainted with the story. So, of course, that's where he jumps. I'm oh, going to So, his wife decided to move out and away with their child, and she moved to the home of her mother. Marie-Ange deserted Gway and went back to her parents and got a job as a waitress in the lower town at a restaurant. In short, Gway went from two women to just one in being himself. He had Mm -hmm. been seemingly rejected by all who he tried to control, and this was, quote, unacceptable to him. He caught... Let's keep in mind that this guy is a failure. This guy literally... Yeah, so he... Caught Marie Ange walking to work one day. He walked up to her and said that if she didn't come back to him, he was going to shoot himself and maybe her too. I suggest that maybe he reversed that process. He should probably just just do himself. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Actually, that wouldn't be reversing the process. I don't know why I wrote that in there. That doesn't work out well. Jesus. So she said to leave her alone. He continued to bother her. A policeman heard them, and when he walked up, Gway ran off. And the policeman stuck around to see if Gway would show up again at the restaurant where Marie-Ange worked. He surely did, and he was arrested and booked for attempted assault with a deadly weapon. Good. He got a lawyer through Mrs. Petra, and the sentence was reduced to carrying a gun illegally. Great. Just great, right? (sighs) Yeah. So he then phoned up Marie-Ange and told her they had to meet. Because of course they did. You know, that's a reading this, that was just like a big time ugh. Like, no. He told her that his wife was going to have her arrested for destroying the Gwei name. And so she met him, and she left for Montreal with Gwei. On their trip to Quebec, he kept an aisle seat and kept looking at his watch in order to complete the timetable he would need to know, presumably, 
for the bombing. <sighs> so plenty of failed plans, downright stupid plans from a stupid person. Yeah, but then he got like an idea. So yeah, then he got an idea. A horrible, no good, downright rotten idea. Just like the goddamn Grinch. <laughs> and this guy. Uh, yeah. So he got together with Ruist and Mrs. Petra to discuss making a bomb. Ruist was good with his hands, said he would put together the detonator in his workshop, and Mrs. Petra would buy the dynamite and detonating caps and fuse. Petra brought 20 half-pound sticks of dynamite and 15 detonating caps and 34-foot length of fuse. Have you noticed anything that has Gway done anything yet? No, no, not really. Gway and Ruist determined that a time bomb was the best option. Of course, Gway had been timing flights going to and from Quebec. He did a lot of selling back and forth jewelry wise. So he was on the plane more than just the times I mentioned. So they made this out of an alarm clock, a dry cell battery, a detonator and a detonating cap. Which all I can think of is like Looney Tunes. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they decided to ask a taxi driver who lived in the apartment below them for help. Genius. They wanted to put the time bomb in the taxi and Mrs. Gway was and and initially what they wanted to do was put the time bomb in the taxi that Mrs. Gway was in. Yeah, he would leave the taxi and then. Yes. Boom. So, yes, that's exactly what I wrote here. <laughs> um, the You're driver welcome. said, yeah, the driver said there was no way he was blowing up his car and he just left. But Mrs. Petra couldn't leave it at that because obviously that would lead him back to them and if the police talk to him oh no so she yeah. wanted to cover her tracks because she didn't want him to know what they were up to so she went to the driver's apartment and said she was only joking about the bomb and what she meant to say was that she wanted to hire him to take an illegitimate child to another city oh my god <laughs> totally believable oh, just totally a slip better. of the tongue right just a slip of the tongue child trafficking instead of a bomb <laughs> right um so Gwai's plan was to have his wife to retrieve two suitcases from the Baia Komu, Kom, you know what, from another place, because he left them <laughs> there earlier. And that's true. He did leave two suitcases of jewelry at, another, at a location on the way to Montreal. So she was going to take a flight, and he thought of this idea because the flight path would take her over the water, and the bomb went off then, there wouldn't be any damaging evidence. At the same time, it was the least likely for her to board by herself, so he had to do some work with her. Gwei had used his good behavior as of late to manipulate her into going, because remember, she had left him and moved in with her mother. Yeah, she left for he sure. Was, he was still hanging around, right? He was actually staying at her mother's house now and again. So, Okay, come on, Mom. He, I know. Well, <laughs> Gwei bought a ticket on Canadian Pacific Airlines on the 1020 flight, to that location where the jewelry was. <laughs> In order to reduce suspicion, he bought her a round trip ticket. Yeah. He must have just been like, oh, I'm so smart. I'm going to do this. Um, How do I cancel so, the return trip without her knowing? Right. Can I cash it in? Um, no, he does something. He does exactly what you're going to expect him to do. So, Gway told Ruiz to set the bomb so that it would explode at 1045 the next morning, as that would ensure the plane was over the water. So, what I'm cl calling boom day. Um, Gway got up early, not normally someone who did so, surprise, surprise, and he picked up the bomb. Ruiz put it in a cardboard carton and had it set to go off at the suggested time of 1045. He gave the package to Mrs. Pietra. Notice he still hasn't really done anything. Um, no. Nope. When she met him at 8.15, she took it by taxi to the airport 12 miles away, and she had it set up to have it shipped out of Flight 108 that morning. Here was the problem with the time bomb concept. What do we all know about planes? They're always fucking late. Yep. So it depended on the airlines running on time. And I know this was 1917, but it seems that the more things change, the more, the more they remain the same. same. Yep. <laughs> So Gwei was psyched that there were no hitches in the old plan, save for one. And, you know, Flight 108 was five minutes late out of Quebec. That doesn't sound like a lot of time. But, yeah. but when while the bomb exploded and the plane fell, it fell on the side of Cap Tourmont, a mountain. It did not fall in the water. That's troubling, yes. Yeah, so Gwei headed back to his mother-in-law's house where he was staying, because of course he was. Yep. 
For some reason, he was still welcome in her house. As I mentioned before, I have no idea why. Now, while her mother-in-law was out, she heard about the crash. Multiple people started calling her once when she was home to see if her daughter was on that flight. So she sent Gwei to the airport to figure out what was going on. And he, of course, obliged. He asked the girl at the ticket office if it was true about the plane crash and if it was his wife's. She said yes, and he put on a show. He collapsed, and someone summoned a priest to comfort him. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. so Quebec. It's such a bastard. Uh, the plane fell in a remote area of the mountain, but people went to find it, including Gwei. I think he went to see if there was any evidence that could lead back to him. Oh, and he likely. saw... This is horrible, but he saw that everyone, all the victims, were horrendously mutilated. Um, in fact, the only victim whose face was still intact was his wife's. Yeah. Okay, that's fucking crazy. It's wild. Um, and not you wild mean, in like a spectacle, but it's just the concept of that being the case. Yeah. You need to um, see my face again. Right. So remember what we said about him cashing in that round trip? Like, can I get the money back? Two days after the crash, he asked his lawyer to find out what the legal steps he should take if Canadian Pacific was found negligent. That's how oh confident God. he was. That's how confident he was that they would never figure out why it fell. So as the investigation was going on, he gave his wife a lavish funeral and put on another show all over again. He had people sobbing for him. Um, the investigation was, yeah, the investigation was actually quite impressive overall. See, people made the assumption that the crash was accidental, but everyone grossly underestimated the wish of an airline that makes a ton of money to prove that it was more than just an accident, right? Yeah. They don't want this to be an accident. In this case, they were right to, to do that. Not but a couple days later, an investigation began. It involved Grant W.G. McConaughey. It almost sounds like McConaughey. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. He was a veteran Bush pilot turned executive. And yes, I am a child. I laughed when I read Bush Pilot. Full disclosure. Uh, Frank M. Francis, an expert aeronautical engineer, both employees of Canadian Pacific Airlines, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Department of Transportation, and the Provincial Police of Quebec. So they were all involved in this. Another person, Bellinger, was involved as well. And this guy was smart as hell. So here's what they discovered just to make things reasonable in terms of time, right? Yeah. They were convinced the plane blew up before it crashed. They spoke to a couple observers who heard an explosion while the plane was still in flight and they saw it tumble from the sky. Planes engines were still turning over when they struck the ground because the tips of the propellers were bent forward. The plane went down nose first, which would have flung people in it towards the front, but bodies were against the back of the passenger compartment, indicating some extremely violent thrust towards the rear of the plane as well. Hmm. One thing that confused investigators was the first people to reach the spot reported smelling something like dynamite yeah so all of this like to me somebody standing there and seeing this and determining this is really impressive like it honestly. is yeah and this is a long yeah. long time ago it was a while ago um the wreckage indicated where the explosion occurred because in the forward baggage section the seat closest to this was flung a quarter of a mile from where the plane crashed oh snap that's a long way so they began looking at the manifest for what was packed in there Eight pieces of hand luggage belonging to passengers, three valises, valises, valise, three vases, three things, and three two typewriters. Three French um, things. Right. Three Air Express packages. One contained automobile parts. Another contained uh, lingerie. And the third one was a 25-pound parcel, contents unspecified, that was shipped from Delphus Bouchard to Alfred Plouf. Their interest was piqued because there was no man named Alfred in, in, in the location where the package was heading. And the, the other man named Delphus knew of no such package that was sent by him. Oh, my. Yes. So a baggage clerk at Quebec Airport described the identity of a person who brought the parcel there. Dark-haired, 40s, arrived by taxi before the plane was scheduled to take off and left in the same taxi. The taxi driver lugged the parcel onto the terminal for the woman. Hmm. So they looked at the passenger manifest as well, and they cut everyone out looking for a possible motive. There were three high-level businessmen that um, that were like in charge of, I can't remember what kind of organization down in the States, but they determined there was no threat towards their life, but they were able to reduce it down to Mrs. Gway. That's, that's so, amazing. 
Yeah. So a judge determined that the death of the passengers was, quote, accidental due to an explosion of undetermined origin. But they didn't say anything about the criminal intent and investigators weren't happy about that. And they wanted those answers to give to the judge. So investigators passed along their thoughts regarding Guay's wife and the municipal police of Quebec let them know about the argument Guay had with Marie Ange, if you remember that, uh, where they ended up arresting him. Mm -hmm. They went to see Marie Ange and described the woman with dark hair and asked if it was anyone Guay knew. And she said it sounded an awful lot like Mrs. Pietra, right? So they also found the taxi driver that took her to to and from the airport. And at this point, Guay and everyone else had assumed that everyone wrote it off as an accident because they determined it was an accident. They didn't yeah. know if an investigation was still going on. But again, investigators were working behind the scenes. So Gway didn't see the story regarding the plane crash being purposeful right away when it was finally determined. The story came out on September 15th. On September 18th, he met up with Mariange again and said after he mourned for a while, the two of them would be able to live happily ever after. Oh. <sighs> on September 19th, he read the story. And upon reading it, he immediately went to see Mrs. Pietra. He told her that he was concerned. They were definitely going to be in trouble, but he had a solution. Mrs. Pietra should commit suicide and leave a note behind explaining that she had put the bomb in the airplane. That would solve it. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> she was concerned about the suggestion, um, <laughs> and she wasn't going to go through with that. She actually told the fiancé of another brother of hers about what Gwei had suggested. She got the idea that she needed to be safe from Gwei, so she called her doctor and had them admit her to the hospital with a recurrent abdominal pain or ailment. She was admitted the next day. When she realized the docs weren't paying attention to her like they should have been, she took enough sleeping pills to make her drowsy so they showed more interest. <laughs> the person she told about Gwei's proposal, Teresa Noel, uh, told the owner of a restaurant about what Mrs. Pietra told her, and he, in turn, told a Canadian Pacific man who was his friend. Ha <laughs> ha Yep. Two days later, Gwei called up Mrs. Pietra and invited her out to celebrate his 32nd birthday. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, why don't you end it and save me? No, 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 no. Come out. Come on out to my, my 32nd birthday. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, also, she he's said only no. 32. Jeez. Right, I know. She declined. Um, two days after that, she was interviewed by authorities, and she told them the following. She took a package at the airport on September 9th. She did it as a favor to Gwei. He told her the package had a statue in it. A ticking statue. Um... <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why today they tell you not to like leave your bags anywhere and don't let it out of your sight. <laughs> right. If you didn't pack it, don't bring it. I uh, know they they actually ended up holding her on the charge of attempting suicide with sleeping pills because that was a crime at that yeah. point. I think it still is in a lot of places, man. Not something okay. they actually charge on, but I think it still yeah. is. Yeah, I think they held her because they th thought that there was something more going on. So Gway heard about what Ms. Mrs. Pietra said to the authorities and had a temper tantrum and he was picked up and arraigned on a charge of murdering his wife. His mother-in-law must have lost her mind because all she said was, quote, he's a boy with big dreams. <laughs> this is his mother-in-law, you know, the mother of the woman he killed. Jesus. <laughs> I can't believe it. So Canadian Pacific investigators turned over the evidence and the job of collecting more to Captain J.A. Mott, chief of detectives. The prosecutor, Noel Dorian, was Quebec's best. Gway was placed in Quebec men's jail, quite a clever name, and authorities put a talker, a stool pigeon, in his cell. Uh, Gway wasn't very bright, right? No, no. He he told he told this guy about Ruist and how he made the bomb. The police immediately went to Ruist and it, he admitted that he did it, but he told he told the authorities that Gway said it was meant to blast stumps. <laughs> And at some point, there was another story going around that he wanted to do, like, dynamite fishing or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure isn't legal anyways. No, it's not. But I guess it's better than contributing to murder. <sighs> Authorities uh, did have a series of impressive tests to determine that TNT was indeed used. And then it could have had the impact on the plane that they saw in the wreckage. Gway's trial began February 24th, 1950. 
by then he was pretty popular. And by that, I mean, people wanted to try and kill him. Uh, Absolutely. Understandable. <laughs> someone, someone literally tried to do so by holding up a liquor store in Massachusetts in order to get enough money to fly to where Gway was. <laughs> I mean, it's so wrong, but also I kind of understand. I'm not mad, right? The trial lasted two and a half weeks. He was tried by an all-male jury, and he seemed that he couldn't be bothered by this trial from start to finish. And he even fell asleep at a point. Um, he, wow. yeah, he displayed emotion at one point in the trial, which is when Marie Ange testified and said that there was no way she could love him any longer. So, of course, it has to do with him, right? Yeah, of course. He was convicted on March 14th after 17 minutes of consideration. <laughs> I'm I mean, you. obviously this guy did it, so great. Yeah. My God, though, both these cases, that is such a short time. <laughs> it really is. Um, and the judge straight up sentenced him to hang. Uh, Gway decided not to appeal, but he did decide to testify against Mrs. Pietra and Ruist because they testified against him. <laughs> Interesting. They're, they're children in a sandbox. Uh, <laughs> he touched me. Yeah. Um Ruist was found guilty on January 3rd, 1951. Uh, January 12th, 1951, Gway was hung, hanged, hanged. He was hanged. <sighs> Why? English. Uh, Mrs. Pietro was charged with murder during Ruist's trial. She was charged with not only murder, but attempted suicide and perjury. Two months after her brother was convicted, she was convicted of murder. Um, so she was convicted of that, but she was acquitted of attempting suicide. I'm guessing murder was enough. Yeah, I think so. Um, Ruist and Mrs. Pietra appealed their convictions, but those were denied. They were hanged within months of each other, 1952 and 1953. Mrs. Pietra Marguerite was the last woman to be hanged in Canada. And that Interesting. is the story of Albert Gouet and the airplane bombing that he took no part in because he was a baby. No Gouet. No, no Gouet. <laughs> No Gway, Jose. <laughs> well, I am glad that there's no Gway left on the uh, male side of this, because, oh, what a douche canoe. He was a douche nozzle, for yes, sure. Yes. So many reasons, and there are so many ups and downs of this story, particularly when he got to biting her Marie Ange face. Ugh. Yeah. And I might be saying Marie Ange wrong, but it sounds impressive to me, and... uh I don't know. I like it. <laughs> I'm sure you're saying it wrong because we don't speak I, French. Well, I assume it's not Marie Ang. So <laughs> I'm guessing it's not Ang. It doesn't sound very, it sounds more German than French. So yeah, so that's our story. But, uh, you know, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, definitely leave us a comment. Let us know. You can find us on all the socials. Just search brew crime literally everywhere. Um, I can be found on Twitter at JT Brews crime. Mike's at brew crime. And then you can also join us on our Patreon, patreon.com slash brew crime. We're doing a lot more stuff on there, interacting with everybody, adding shows beforehand that are ad free, doing Patreon only episodes, crazy videos and fun stuff like that. Um, yeah. And we've got ourselves some patrons. Yes, we do. We have Jay is Rad, True Crime Nana, Three Biz in Podcast, and the Faves of Our Lives. Thanks, all of y'all. Thank you very much. And that's it for Quebec for now. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Absolutely. I'm, that's a reference to one guy, and I'm pretty sure I did Sean Connery. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely did. Everybody have a great one. We'll see you next time. Bye. All cases in brew crime are written by Mike and JT or a writer we credit on the episode and sources are put into our show notes for each episode. We always want to give credit to the people that research the cases we talk about. Check out our store at tpublic.com slash stores slash brew hyphen crime hyphen podcast where you can purchase gear like t-shirts, phone cases, stickers, pillows, and all kinds of other cool stuff. Brew Crime's intro was created by Mike using Creative Commons Attribution Licensed Audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. Logo designed by Ben Greenberg. Thanks for listening to this episode of Brew Crime Podcast. Want me to Welcome, do it? To, <laughs> Go welcome it. to Brew Crime. <laughs> Where, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs>
Welcome, Welcome to Brew to Crime. Crime. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> In stereo. The other man who they found, Alfred Pluff, knew of no, sorry, no. The pro- I mean, maybe he was hung, but he was hanged too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. 